Welcome to the February 2015 episode of Iowa City in Focus. I'm your host, Mary Bryant. Now winter snow can provide a lot of fun opportunities for recreation, but let's face it, when the temperature dips too low, no one wants to be outside. On this month's episode, we'll look at a pilot program the City of Iowa City has implemented to encourage winter recreational activities on its trails. Then we'll look at a temporary overnight shelter that was put in place this winter for people who have nowhere else to go to get out of the cold. Stay tuned. Today I'm out at Terry Trueblood Recreation Area and I'm talking with Zachary Hall, who is the City of Iowa City's Parks and Forestry Superintendent. And we're talking about a new recreational winter trails pilot program. Uh, so Zach, what exactly is this pilot program? Um, <clears throat> basically we're analyzing where we clear uh, snow from uh, trails, uh, some parking lots in some of the parks, and um, and you know we're doing it one to analyze how it would help uh, with budget constraints and also um, at the same time maybe foster some new or uh, expand on our winter recreation uh, opportunities. Okay and how did this all come about? Well uh, coming new into the organization it was brought to my attention that there were potentially areas that we could um, change the maintenance of, of our winter trails and we started with uh, Terry Trueblood when this area opened. Um, we identified that this should be used as a as a uh, area for winter recreation uh, around around the park on the trails there. So we're referring to this as an expansion of that. Um, and we've partnered with H two O Fin and Feather to uh, to allow for ice skating uh, down at Sand Lake here. They rent out ice skates, um, and so this is the second year that we've fostered that program, and uh, we're excited this year because we've added a recreational skating loop component. Um, the outer loop is 900 feet uh, approximately, and then the inner loop is, a, is about 500. So. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So as far as um, you mentioned that this pilot program is also for expanding recreational activities, um, how, how do you decide what gets cleared and what doesn't <laughs> then? You know, where is the recreation going on and where do people actually need to be walking on, on sure. clear ground? And basically what we've done is we've used a program called uh, Strava or Strava Labs. Uh, it's, a, it's a program that uses um, basically crowdsourcing or information from its users and uh, they create heat maps indicating the uh, usage frequency uh, along trails. And so. There's about 1,500 uh, users within Johnson County that subscribe to this service. And so <clears throat> we've used that as a baseline to determine where, where the most commuter trails uh, we think would be. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the tricky part is, okay, how, how do we see uh, where we're getting the most use? So that's the best data that we have so far. We're definitely looking for more data and we're welcoming comments and, and input. Um, we are trying to focus more on commuter trails and, and trail systems that uh, connect to essential services and schools and whatnot. So some of the re more recreational loops that don't have that connectivity, that's where we've identified that we can maybe put those into a different level of maintenance that would create those winter, oper sure. winter recreational sure, opportunities. Sure, leave the snow there, clear the, the places for people trying to commute or just get someplace important. Correct. Okay. Yep. So how can people determine which trails will be cleared if they're trying to plan for their recreation or their, sure. their travel? Sure. Yeah, they can access uh, icgov.org and um, uh, type in winter recreational pilot program, trail pilot program, and they should be able to um, access the link. And uh, there are, I believe, eight um, PDF maps that indicate which sections of those specific trails will be cleared and which won't during this pilot program. Um, we eventually we will make a citywide map that will indicate where the trails will be cleared but being that it's a pilot program we're waiting until we figure out if this is something that we're going to continue to do. Okay, is your map changing over the course of these few months as you hear back from the various users? Well, given the snow that we've had this winter and um, that we 
you know, we really like to try and understand, you know, the brevity of, of what people are using and, and whatnot. We're going to stick to the maps that we have and, the, and how we've outlined things for this season, just so we have a good baseline to go off of as far as what we what we need to change for next season. And do you want people to let you know what they think of it? We do, we really do. You know, we don't, we don't want people to be shy or, or um, you know, um, have, have any ill feelings about what we're doing, but we do want to hear those comments. We, we need to understand um, how our trail users are using the trails in the winter, you know, if this is a good idea, if, if things need to be adjusted. We're welcoming all comments and, and we're open, open to suggestions. Great. Well, thanks for talking to me on this chilly day and I hope that you uh, have great success with your pilot program. Thanks, Mary. This next segment deals with winter's harsher side, the cold. I recently met up with Chrissy Canganelli, the executive director of Shelter House, to talk about the temporary shelter that's been set up this winter to take in anyone who needs a warm place to stay overnight. So far, it's exceeded expectations and has served 65 different people in the first month it's been open. The purpose of this temporary shelter is to serve a population that really doesn't access Shelter House itself, um, or when they try, they're not successful. Uh, so um, I'll start back with the approach and the conversation that happened with the Iowa City Police Department um, in the spring of 2014. Um, Officer Schwint is a member of the Local Homeless Coordinating Board, which is a coalition of different organizations that in some way, shape, or form uh, work with people who are experiencing homelessness in our community. and. Um, uh, he came to one of our meetings and said uh, that the Iowa City Police Department had for quite a number of years during the severest winter uh, weather had provided essentially shelter at City Hall for people who were living on the street um, or could not, would not access shelter house services. This is a very service resistant, chronically homeless population. Um, and we knew that from time to time that that happened um, and we're grateful for that support that the police department had offered throughout the years. Because of the very brutal nature of of last winter, um, they found themselves not just doing it for a night here or there, but chronically throughout the winter, um, opening up the doors of City Hall for that, that purpose. And it really, it, they do not have the facilities or the, the space to do that. So um, we formed a little task force, a subcommittee, and uh, started detailing out what would need to happen to get this project going. Um, and soon realized, of course, that uh, the make or break issue and need that we would face was a space to be able to do this, because we were looking at at um, just a pilot proposal, a temporary uh, shelter that would open for two or three months during the winter. We didn't want a long-term commitment or facility. Um, so th that made it a little different in going at, out and asking uh, folks, how, you know, would they be able to support us or provide that space? It's not something that would have worked well uh, with the faith communities that we'd partnered in the past for overflow services um, because we needed a fixed location. So we would really need to monopolize that space for the duration of the project. Um, members of the local homeless coordinating board then were involved in doing different presentations to different groups throughout town um, and one presentation that they did was to the Downtown Business Association um, that was in late October and it was immediately after that meeting that Kevin Digman from Hodge Construction came to me and said hey we've got a vacant storefront we think that, that it would work well for this project um, and that's really got ev that got everything rolling. It was like Halloween uh, that we came came over here, took a look at the space, had the city uh, staff uh, take a look at the space, and there was consensus that this was a location that would work well, and um, we're able to then start building the necessary funds to be able to pay for staff and insurance and utilities. Um, and then some things that we thought would be expenditures ended up not, for example, Hodge Construction ended up donating the entire cost of the rent um, as a contribution to the project. So that was a huge cost savings for us. Um, so we learned those things along the way. But that's kind of how it, it came to be. Um, and again, it, it's to serve people who are not accessing Shelter House. Um, either they've been evicted or they do not want to come in uh, and live in that environment where there are families and kids. Um, there are many of the individuals uh, our chronic substance abusers. Um, we at Shelter House, it's a dry facility. We breathalyze every night. So this is a group of folks that are not accessing services successfully anywhere else in the community, um, at least shelter services. So we wanted to have that stop cap service um, to just help prevent uh, the, you know, anyone from freezing to death or suffering from mm -hmm. um, frostbite or other issues that happen during the winter. 
Well, I'm really glad to hear how the community was able to come together and really support this. Yep, it was tr a tremendous experience. It happened over a very short period of time and quite a privilege really to be a part of uh, bringing together these different sectors of the community. So we have partners from the private business community, um, the United Way, community foundation, so private donors are supporting the project, and then the public sector with the support of the Iowa City Police Department, City of Iowa City, Johnson County, Coralville, able to get this across the region um, to uh, have those conversations and the support coming to, to make this you know, short-term project happen in a very uh, tight timeline. Do you s foresee the need for this next year? I, I think that, um, well, there's always been a need for this service. Mm -hmm. um, in very, you know, uh, critical situations, as I said, the police department has been able to help. Uh, now that we've had this kind of a service available for a couple of months, um, you know, without interruption, uh, I think that there have been realized benefits across the community and there is interest in seeing something like this made available for next winter so that it's not going back to kind of a, uh, you know, we'll make the city hall work for a night here or there. I think that there's consensus that this is a good idea, um, it's needed, and that there's a public benefit for this. Uh, so we are interested in looking at how we can replicate this. Um, potentially it would be for December, January, and February of next year. But again, we'll still face the, the same obstacle is where would we locate it and be able to have access to a, an appropriate facility for that short period of time um, where it's not significantly uh, expensive. Yeah. So, Can you go briefly into some of those benefits? Has the police department seen um, an effect on the community? Sure. So um, the immediate benefit is to the individual that's served. They're not faced uh, living in a da dangerous situation and exposure uh, uh, on the street during the winter months. They're able to come into a safe, warm environment that is staffed. They have access to other services and facilities if a medical emergency uh, comes up. So there's the personal and individual human benefit. Um, to the overall community then, I, the immediately there's um, been a benefit realized by the police department, um, which uh, calls for vagrant, uh, labeled vagrant uh, services um, have re been reduced by about 95 percent over this same period last year. Uh, that's a significant savings in both time and energy on the part of the police department. So um, as compared to last winter where they were frequently called out uh, to check these different concerns which might be I have somebody sleeping in the stairwell of my apartment or in the hallway or in the laundry room of my apartment building, what do I do or this doesn't feel safe, mm -hmm. those kinds of calls, there's been a reduction by 95 percent. That's tremendous and that means that the police are not scattered across the community. They're coming and, and able to serve um, number one in a proactive way just by coming through here and making things, you know, sure that things are okay here. Um, but they're able to prioritize their, their time then in a different way and meet higher needs that they face. So I think that that's significant. Um, what we don't know for certain, but other communities who have had these kinds of services available throughout the year and especially in the winter months have been able to report uh, decreases in vandalism and other kinds of mm -hmm. criminal activity because again you don't have people in desperate situations uh, doing desperate things. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a reduction all the way around and we haven't researched that aspect of it, but we do know that one data point with respect to the, the vagrant. And we're very excited about um, being able to be a part of this short-term uh, solution, but most invested in a longer-term solution mm -hmm. for this population. So that's really looking at the cost savings that we would have, not just for the individual, but for the communities across uh, Johnson County um, by providing permanent supportive housing solutions for these individuals. And, and that's something that the Local Homeless Coordinating Board will be working on in the next two years. You can watch all of these segments again by visiting citychannel4.com slash video or by turning to Channel 5 and calling in to Video On Demand. Also, we would like to know what city departments and programs you'd like to hear more about. Let us know by sending an email to info at citychannel4.com or leave us a comment on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash citychannel4. Thanks for watching this month's episode and keeping Iowa City in focus. We'll see you next time.